Hello and welcome to Quite the Ordinary Podcast with Moonlight and West. Today I am joined by a very special guest going by the name of Nadia Sheikh. Welcome! But I feel like that title really encapsulated what that t- period of time was mm. for me. Um, and it's just like banging your head against the wall constantly mm. and nothing seems to work. Um, so that's kind of like why the sentiment of the the why I use that title for the EP, but also the mm. title of the song, the actual song speaks about you can never please anyone, you can never please yourself. Like it's kind of like wanting to break from break away from the expectations of people and society has of you, but feeling like you can't. Mm. So like the songs the song starts, I wanna rise, uh, find the skies. I want to rate my feels and feel the fears in the moment. It's kind of like I want to live. I want to like experience things. I want to like sort of be free. Mm. Hello and welcome to Quite the Ordinary Podcast with Moonlight and West. Today I am joined by a very special guest going by the name of Nadia Sheikh. Welcome! Hello, thank you. <laughs> Honestly, Nadia, I have so much I'd like to go through with you. And I'm going to start with your achievements because I need everyone who's watching and listening to know that we are joined by some serious, serious talent. So let's begin with where you've performed at. Supporting Stereophonics across 19 dates at their European Kind Tour, including sold out arenas in Manchester and Cardiff. Warming up the crowd for PJ Harvey at Noches del Botinco. Botanico, yeah. Botanico, <laughs> Botanico, Madrid. Gracing stages at festivals such as Glastonbury, Isle of Wight, Kendall Calling, Why Not, IFB Festival. Oh my gosh. And you've not only done that, you've also been on TV performing on Spanish national TV and your songs have been played on multiple radio stations such as BBC Radio 1, BBC 6 Music, Radio X, Radio 3 in Spain, Planet Rock and you've been featured in Clash Magazine and Rolling Stone France. Nadia, the way I'm out of breath from having to just read (laughs) the things that you've done and the things that you've achieved. Do you feel like you're still at the beginning of your career in a sense of like you still got so much more you want to do? Or are you just kind of settled in and relaxed in what you've achieved and you just want to continue that? It's hard because I never really like sit back and and think, oh, I've done all these things. It's just kind of like I always want to do more. Really? I'm really bad at looking back and like being okay you've done some cool stuff unless I'm like writing my bio which is I've, I've written that the bio in like my website and everything but um yeah I am very much the what's next like looking forward and what else can I do so I'm proud of everything I've done yeah but I even though it's not the beginning of my career I very much feel like there's still so much more I want to do wow do you mind sharing what more you would like to do yeah I mean I'd love to fill some of those venues that I played with Stereophonics with my own crowds mm. like I'd love to do that I'd love to tour America I'd love to um release an album there's so many things that I really want to do there's so many venues I want to play uh there's festivals I want to come back to and like play bigger stages mm. like there's just so much I want to do but yeah I, f- I think a few of those is there's a few venues I'd love to fill with my own audience and then I'd love to do an album. Well, more than one, obviously, but... Yeah, we want one. more than one. Not that we need more yeah, than one, one album. One. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've performed at some incredible places already and to be on such big stages for such big festivals, Nadia, what is that feeling like to actually be there in person, live, on a stage? I love it. I adore it. Like, I love making music. I love writing songs and I love being in the studio and being creative, but I live for being on a stage and... I don't know what what it is. I I think it's like the connection. It's hard to explain. But when when I started making music, I started playing live. So I started playing covers or what not. Like I was writing songs, but I didn't have enough to play like an entire set of my own songs. So I just threw myself out there, and I was really shy. 
but I was just performing like an hour and like barely saying anything. But <laughs> for some reason, I, I was just hooked to it. So, yeah, there is something about just performing live. How were you able to overcome those fears of being shy and nervous? I think just, just in a way, forcing myself to do it, like mm. just doing it over and over again. There was something about it that I loved so much that was bigger than my fear or my anxiety Ooh. about being on that stage. It's I don't really know how to explain it. I literally, I'd look at the floor for like the whole set, like say thank you, not even say my name, like not say the names of the songs. I was so shy. Um... But I don't know why I just kept on doing it until you grow comfortable. You start to believe in, or like, you start to sit into your skills and you feel more comfortable with what you're doing, more in control, which mm. eases the tension. And so, and I still get nervous sometimes, like a lot of times actually. Naturally. But, but I just love performing. And how many performances did you do leading up to some of the bigger festivals, such as Isle of Wight and Glastonbury? Oh my gosh. I started performing when I was. 13 that was my first gig ever was when I was 13 and I never really stopped from 13 yeah well I, I was doing like the odd gig there and like then but since I was I want to say like 16 or 17 I was I think 17 to 18 I was pretty much performing every weekend <laughs> wow yeah like it was I don't have siblings so it was me and my parents in the car that was a weekend like we'd, we'd go to this whatever like wherever someone would call me to perform like I've played literally everywhere and anywhere like like venues, like like pubs, like like arts, like artsy places. Like my first ever gig was opening proper gig, like not performance, but like my first proper gig was opening um, for a, they, they were opening this like art gallery in mm -hmm. Spain in the mountain, um, literally in the middle of like the mountain. It was like a house in the middle of the mountain. What? It was an art gallery, and it was January or February. I think it was February. Mm. It was freezing cold and they set me out outside. That was my first ever gig. <laughs> outside in the freezing yeah. cold in and the mountains. It was so cold. They had to give us the gloves, uh, the, like the, um, gosh, the, my words. The, um, um, oh my days. Are you trying to say like those, the, um, the <laughs> we're both struggling. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. No, no, you don't. Oh, I the know. The gardeners. That. The gardeners gloves. They had to give us because my uncle was performing with me. I was thirteen. So he kind of like set up with me and like we were playing we we're gonna play together. And um we had to get the gardener's gloves, cut out the fingers <laughs> to be able to play because it was so cold. Yeah. I'm speechless. That was my first ever gig. So <laughs> my first ever public performance was uh, like a high school thing. Yeah. Like and then I, my teacher told me to enter like this competition they were doing in a, in a, a thing called a Gordo Inglés, which is like, I don't know, like John Lewis or something. Okay. Um, so I played in front of like little audiences there and like a, a, a panel of judges and I came second. Ooh. So they put me on my local newspaper and people saw me there. And, like the old ladies in the town were like, oh, you're the girl that sings, whatever. So they did this like... Um, this charity ball that they did every year mm. and they called me to come and perform and that was my first ever like performance and it was like six, seven hundred people and I remember my legs shaking to the point of like playing the guitar and like sat down and my knees were like like literally shaking and I just could not stop them I was like what's going on so I just kind of like went in deep sorry that was a long winded no question. <laughs> that was a beautiful answer because I cannot imagine what it would have been like to have like one of your first performances being in front of 600 to 700 people and the leg shaking very real how were you able to prepare for what was going to be such a monumentous moment in your life I don't think I prepared <laughs> I, you just I, I, had, I just did it. Yeah, I th really. I think that's, that's what happens with me. Well, that's how my brain works. I don't think about it. I just go and do it. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you can never really be prepared, really. Like uh, until you do your first gig, you're never going to prepare to gig. Mm. That's what we all ask with like um, Man when we played Manchester Arena. They was like, "Oh my god, <clears throat> how do you prepare for Manchester Arena?" I was like, "You don't." <laughs> and, and we found out we were playing it two days before, which is kind of nice because I didn't get time to like. Straight you did, yeah. <laughs> you didn't have time to feel the anxiety or yeah. like, well, it's in two days. I don't have much time to think about it. Yeah, two days though. I mean, okay. How did you even get round to getting that job then? For so we we'd already done the European tour with Stereophonics. Um, we did sixteen shows, and then we came back 
our last gig was in Germany, in Hamburg, and we came back to the UK and we went to Spain. Me and my band went to Spain to, to film for TV. Yes. The first time we did that. Um, and then Sorry Funnies went and started their arena tour in the UK and they had their support, uh, an American ba- band called uh, The Wind and the Wave. Uh, but then COVID started happening and America was going to close the borders. So they sent... Well, they, they they had to go back before they closed the borders. So I was actually, I was hoovering a drum room doing a trial shift for a new job because I lost half of my job because I went on tour. Wow. And my phone had broken. Sacrifice. So I had one of these like little Vodafone like, like replacement phones. Literally two buttons. It was no. terrible. It was hor- horrendous. And I get a phone call from, from the production team being like, oh, we might need you Saturday, Sunday in Cardiff. And I was like, I'll speak to the man. But yeah, we'll be there. And then I get a text saying, maybe Friday in Manchester. And I was like, Friday tomorrow. And he was like, yeah. Actually, not day, two days, one day. It's like Friday tomorrow. And I was like, yeah, yeah, we'll be there. We'll be there. Like, I'll, I'll call you later to confirm once I've spoken to them, but we'll be there. And I went online and it was Manchester Arena. And I was like, guys, we have to be there tomorrow. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That all happened so fast. Do you feel like when you started putting yourself out there, you started doing these performances and yeah, you just made yourself visible to the public eye. Was it then around that period where opportunities started to come your way? I think it's been, it's it, it's about, it's just hard work. Like mm. I remember when I moved to London, I was playing every single week. Like oh. every single week I had like one or two gigs, whether it was an open mic or like a little gig in a bar in Camden, like acoustically, I, I didn't even have a band. Like, wow. I'd never had a band. I did, I did one gig with a band before and it was sort of like a one-off gig. Mm. Uh, but I'd never played with a band. So I just, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm in London, I'm going to play. Um, So it's just been about, it's really funny how like things happen. Because mm. one thing will open a little door and you'll do another thing that you think, oh God, like whatever, that's not going to go anywhere. Or you might even have a bad gig mm. and you don't think anything of it. But then suddenly someone is in the audience or... You, you meet someone at the gig or... And it, I think, like, all the things I've done have sort of happened like that f- by me putting myself out there, mm. doing my best job, like, the best w- work I could do, whether it's music or playing a gig or being nice to people, like... Mm, underestimated. Being nice. Just be nice. Yeah. And the thing is, like, then people will give you opportunities. And if you if you prove that you are worth the opportunity, they will give you another one. Mm-hmm. Or they might recommend you to someone else. So it's all it's always been I've never had like a label that would open the door for me or like Yeah, it's it's all been I don't want to say it's just been me and my hard work because that's not true. Because I have my band and my family and mm. I've had people in my team as well I got a publisher and I've had law- great lawyers and people that really believe in me but it's also been the other people that are not part of the official team that you might meet that still give you a chance mm. or that will go and get you gigs so there's so many people that sort of are part of those opportunities whether they're direct or not if that makes sense that's real no that makes super 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 clear sense and how did you come around finding your band and playing with them uni uni yeah I, I, yeah they're the best the best thing I got out of uni <laughs> yeah. we've been playing together for so long and it was gonna be like it was random as well because um I'd played with Rowan my bass player um in some of like the uni like workshops or whatever mm. and I knew George because he used to well like uni halls right so I yeah something like that but um I had I got a gig offered by a friend a guy I met again playing like a random gig somewhere he was like oh I'm doing my headline show um for my EP and do you want to support and I was like yeah yeah great and it was at the Bedford and and then I was like wait is this a band gig or like just acoustic and I was like yeah bring your band and I was like oh yeah, uh, okay. I'm gonna need <laughs> Rowan and George, please. Yeah. Well, it wasn't. I didn't have George. I had another George on guitar, and then we had uh, another guy from uni called Lloyd. Okay. Um, and I was like, guys, I've got this one gig. Do you want to do it? Whatever. It's gonna be one gig. Is that the one-off gig? Uh, yeah. So this was, was the uh the one-off gig that no, you no, done no, with no. the band. Oh, no, okay. This was back back in Spain before. Ah, uh, gotcha. Yeah. No, that that was like a different thing. No, but I was like, it's only gonna be one gig. Like I got for this, whatever. And they're like, yeah, sure. So we did the gig 
And then because I was on listings or whatever, another promoter contacted me. He was like, oh, we saw you play this. Do you want to play this other gig? And I was like, guys, um, I've got another gig. Do you want to do it? <laughs> and, it and everyone was like, yeah, sure. Apart from the drummer, Lloyd. And then George came in. Ah. And I actually remember being in, in a house party, a uni thing, uh, in Rowan's house. And I remember Rowan sat George next to me just to like force the conversation oh, to, to see what I was like going to get him into like a trial rehearsal. <laughs> and we did it. And w we've been playing ever since. Wow. So how many years has it been now? God. Eight, nine. Wow. That's beautiful. That's insane. I can't believe that. That's like... You don't stop to think about these things, right? <laughs> yeah. I love those guys so much. This is the moment to think about it now, Nadia. I'm quite the ordinary yeah. podcast yeah, of yeah, Moonlight yeah. West. I can't believe, like, I just had thought, like, yeah, eight, eight, eight or nine years. Because it wasn't the first year that we started playing. Mm. It was in uni. It was, I think it was second year. Wow. So it must have been, like, <gasps> and what's the age. <laughs> what's the difference between playing in a band and playing acoustic? It's very different. I used to, people used to say, like, oh, are you not, like scared of going up on stage by yourself and at, and at first when I started playing with the boys I felt so much more at ease mm. playing by myself than with them just because that's what I've been doing mm. since I was 13 so I'm in control I know what I'm doing if I mess up I can pick myself up if you're playing with other people it's much harder to yeah. like you have to really know each other and know the songs and it, I felt way more less in control yeah so I always felt like acoustic was like my place but but I, obviously we've been playing for so long um I don't have that feeling anymore um but it's very different I love both so much because what you can't have that sort of like powerful sound by yourself I mean you can but not not it's not like having a band mm. and also you're not sharing that energy with anyone else but I also love the straight down the line super intimate connection you get when you're it's just you there's something about it it's like there's nothing else. Mm. There's no one else to hide behind. There's no extra sounds. There's no, it's just you and the audience. So I feel like it's a more conversational thing. Whereas with a band, it's, some, it's solid. I don't know how to explain it. Mm. It feels like you need to put a lot of faith and trust into, into the whole band really to deliver what is like a beautiful song. For example, let's talk about your EP, Never Ending Trial. What a masterpiece, a six song EP. I can really tell you put your heart and soul into that, Nada. You talk about a lot of deep topics such as, oh my God, heartbreak, depression, anxiety. What is it like putting your heart into an EP like that? I think for me, m music and especially like words is like, it's like therapy mm. and I'm sure you get that with like p probably everyone that you interview but it I find that I understand myself and my feelings better when I put them out in that way mm. in fact I've written songs that have genuinely helped me understand what was going on in my brain wow um, that's powerful and I've written songs where I've realized what I was writing about afterwards it's really strange like the first time that happened I was really young and I really didn't realize mm. um but I've noticed that it like keeps on happening at a lesser level because now that I've written more songs and I've grown as a songwriter, I, I can use the tools in a more like tailored way. Mm -hmm. If you want to, not sure if that's the right way to explain it, but it's cathartic. It's like you sort of need to get it off your chest and it's mm -hmm. like journaling. Mm. And do you journal outside of songwriting? Yes. Okay, wow. So have you ever incorporated anything you've written in your journal into a song? Mm, not directly, but feelings, yes. Mm -hmm. And like situations. So like the things I might journal about are the things that I might also need to get off my chest in a song. But the songwriting came first. Okay. So journaling for me is, is a thing from two, three years ago, maybe. Mm. Whereas I've been writing songs since I was like 12. Yes, that's young age. Um, yeah. Topics and stuff like that, yes, but not so much direct quotes. I don't really read my journals back. I just write them and that's it. Just to get it off your chest. Yeah, I just like, that's it. Like, I've got a box full of like notebooks and I'm like, 
I should just ban them. Yeah, but, same. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> but, yeah, whatever. <laughs> in fact, I, I like I have gone back to a couple of journals. When I started journaling, like, and I then I did it for a while, and I came back to it, and I was like, wow, I was really feeling things. Yeah. That in my life, but, <laughs> I, yeah. Whereas with my notes on my phone or like my song book or mm. like songs I've started and never finished, I do go back to that a lot. Got you. Um, yeah. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And Never Ending Trial, I mean, the title in itself almost feels like quite torturing Nadia. It's like Never Ending Trial. It's like you can never finish something, like co- continuously trying and just always failing like that's how the title feels like to me I'd love to know what your thought process was behind writing like creating that title and obviously it's the title of one of your songs as well but I'd love to know what why that title that I'm so glad that comes across (laughs) because that is part of like the meaning of it um I feel that that so that is the name of the song the song was written first obviously and then I don't usually title well I say that, but I, I like to title EPs with something that is in the name of, of a song. Mm. But I feel like that title really encapsulated what that t- period of time was mm. for me. Um, and it's just like banging your head against the wall constantly mm. and nothing seems to work. Um, so that's kind of like why the sentiment of the, the why I use that title for the EP, but also the mm. title of the song, the actual song speaks about you can never please anyone, you can never please yourself. Like, it's kind of like wanting to break from, break away from the expectations of people and society has of you, but feeling like you can't. Mm. So like the song, the song starts, I want to rise, uh, find the skies. I want to rate my feels and feel the f- fears in the moment. It's kind of like, I want to live, I want to like experience things. I want to like sort of be free. Mm. Um, And there's a line in the second verse that is kind of like, I'm coloring by numbers and I know that I must excel. So it's kind of like you have to, you have to, you have to be perfect. You have to always do. And I feel like in a way that is also linked to maybe being female. Mm. Just what's expected of you. And like, you have to be correct. You have to be polite, but not too nice. But you have to be really nice. But Mm. all these things and you can never please anyone. Mm. And in the end, you start to lose yourself. So it feels like a never ending trial because if you're too polite, you're it's wrong because you're too polite if you're a bit rowdy you can't be too rowdy like Mm. so it's a bit that sort of like a constant bout almost like where do you kind of fall into place where do you sit and what can you even do like as you said at the beginning like it's almost like banging your head against the wall that energy really comes across but what I love is that right after a never-ending trial in your EP you've got don't give it up which is like it feels like a little bit of relief (laughs) A little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. I'm like, okay, never ending trial, but don't give it up. <laughs> Hang in there. Yeah. Was it intentional to put like a more uplifting lyrically song I've after never ending trial? That, so definitely not. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was thinking more sonically than I was. Because listening through, I was like, okay, I'm not gonna give up now. No, that's good. That's good. No, I not intentionally in that sense. I was thinking more how the EP flowed sonically mm. at, at that stage but that's great isn't it that's I'm glad that's having that effect <laughs> intuitively it fell into place it's nicely like, here's a slap but it's okay yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. and how is it do you order your so you said sonically then mm-hmm. is that how you order your songs within an EP um I think it's like <clears throat> about I like so so my my music is quite eclectic in in a way so mm. it ebbs and flows the songs are quite different they, they sound like cohesive but they're all quite different True. So for me it's important that even like a, a set list in the gig like that it takes you like sort of on a journey so it's not like like you can't have all the fast songs at the beginning and then all the slow because then it doesn't you need to balance it out and like mm. make it enjoyable it's like a film I guess like you have to structure it so it's it's a journey rather than just a song mm. so I think of that um in that way as well and and obviously what are going to be like the strongest songs which are like the slower songs like maybe are they all singers are they not like how do you put that so it makes sense as a body of work rather than just random songs Mm -hmm. one thing that I love about the way that you create music is that I find a theme in a lot of your songs that there's this build up and then eventually like like 
the drums come in or the guitar comes in and it's like this big finale and it feels like an explosion, almost like a release of emotions finally when you build up to the chorus. What is your songwriting process like that makes you feel like that? That's cool that you say. I, th- I am a sucker for a for a climax. For a, I love dynamic music and mm. I think all of us in the band do. Like We all like songs and, and sort of music that makes you feel stuff like yeah. through, th- makes you feel throughout the song we can feel it trust me i feel like i'm going on a roller coaster <laughs> it's like going up stuff and it's like duh, 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 and i'm like ah! that's great that's great because that is sort of the intention and and i think in a way it's also dictated a lot by how i write the songs because usually i'll write them acoustically like oh. well usually not all the time <laughs> um either on the guitar or the piano and then the arrangement is sort of build around the track so there is potentially that default of maybe starting with a guitar and a vocal, just like bringing it right in and then building from there. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I love dynamic music and I love songs that suddenly like, oh, where did that go? And then suddenly yeah. it's back. Like, I love that. I love that surprise as well. And in a, in all of your songs, actually, like what I, I keep on saying what I love about your music because <laughs> I'm a big fan, Nadia. I'll be honest, I'm a big fan. In your songs as well, what I love is that you have real instruments incorporated into your music that's such an important factor to me when listening to music of course like I love a beat I love some production but like a real instrument like hearing them raw it's so impactful for me as someone who really appreciates music especially live music like yourself is is that do you do that on purpose or is that just because of your own talents of being able to play on the piano and guitar that you've just implemented it I mean I think I, I I am introducing more uh, production, electronic production elements. Um, there there are more, for example, in Never Ending Trial than there were in the previous EPs. But the music I grew up on the Beatles. I grew up on like mm. Queen, ABBA, like mm. Oasis. I, I love real instruments and I love guitar music. Me too. And I love the sound and the feeling of an instrument. And that's what I use. That those are my tools. Like. I sit and write on a guitar or a piano. So it's it, it's really important for me to have those elements. For example, we're going to record soon again um, and we're going to go and record drums because I, yes, there's great software right now for drums and most people wouldn't be able to tell, mm. but I want real drums. Mm. Like, want I want the authenticity. Yeah, I need that. And I was a bit purist, you could say, like, I don't know, a few years ago, I was like, no, because I make guitar music and it's like indie rock and it needs to be like, no like backing tracks and no this and no like too much like synths or whatever. <laughs> and now I'm like, just serve the song and evolve. And I love and I love being creative and like growing. Um, So it's probably naivety, mm-hmm. but there are more elements of more modern production in the last couple of EPs than there were f- in my first EP, for example. Mm. Um, Yeah. And your band obviously plays a big part in bringing those instruments to life on your tracks. How does a song get created when working with your band? Do you go with them with an idea, with the lyrics, with the whole concept down already and they just elevate it? Or do you like to go to them and actually start from the beginning? Both. Um, they are like they are part of what Nadia Shake is. Like mm. The sound is our sound mm. I'll never say it's my sound is the Nadia Shake sound yes because it's my name and it's my project but they are part of that um, we've been playing together for so long and we work on everything together like all the music together um, so yeah there's been times where I might have come with like I call it vomit demos <laughs> vomit demos yeah because I, I'm like all the ideas out like I'll be like I've written this song and I'll be like blah, 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 all these like ideas and they're quite messy and like all over the place and I'll just send them that and we'll <laughs> work from there and like strip back the bad stuff uh, and they're like oh they, that that's that that that's interesting that's pretty crap but that's interesting <laughs> and we'll build from there there's other times where uh we I've come in like there's a song called memories that I wrote uh, last year and I was really excited about it so I showed it to them and we we're going to work on something else that day that we met like two days after I wrote the song but instead of doing that we just went straight into building that song together wow. and there's even been times where I've written a song and I've just sent them like a piano demo and then Rowan or, or George either of them uh, will have said oh like can you send me like the dem- like the stems because like I'm hearing something and they'll send me something back production wise that is exactly like they just got it so right and really? then we'll build 
from there together. So it's very, very collaborative and we all have ideas and we all like challenge each other with ideas and yeah, like we work on everything together. That's so beautiful that you have that kind of a relationship with them. And part of that relationship, obviously, as you said, comes with positive criticism. You've mentioned, you know, sometimes they'll tell you, that's rubbish, that's a little bit bad, but yeah. nah, that's not good. How are you able to, how do you deal with that kind of, I won't say negativity, but that positive criticism? Because obviously they want what's best for you. How are you able to, like, you know, manoeuvre and deal with that? I think because we know each other so well, and we work together for so long, we're past that point, but mm. we also trust each other. We trust each other's talent and each other's ideas. Mm. So, also, I, th I don't think any of us are like too like precious with mm. ourselves. Like, we will take the criticism rather than get all diva like or like. Mm. Ah. Um, but we're also very strong in our ideas. So, for example, if I don't like something but they're trying to push it forward. I'll be like, okay, let's run with it. Let's try it. But if I really, really don't like it, I'll be like, I don't like it. I yes. like that. And the same way, thing the other way. Like if I have a base idea, for example, and I send it to Rowan, he's like, mm, then he's a bass player. Mm. So I won't have something on the song that I really don't like, but also I'm not going to force him to do something that he really, really dislikes. Mm. So we are really we have a really good balance and like a really good harmony working together and I think we all respect each other a lot and I think that's important I love that so much I love that you've got respect for one another and especially since you've been working for such a long time the fact that you've been able to not only maintain but evolve and flourish in this in this relationship with one another is so beautiful to see how does that how does your rehearsals come to life when you're on a live stage do you feel like it's the same kind of feeling or is it completely different because there's a huge crowd in front of you oh very different <laughs> yeah <laughs> very very different um yeah the pressure's on when you're in a gig because um, you can mess up a rehearsal and I was gonna know true but um yeah it's, it's very different um and before we used to rehearse a lot more mm. um but now George moved so it's much harder to get three of us in a room. So now our de like our demo sessions are on Zoom most of the time. Wow. Because um it's more convenient. Um yeah. But yeah, like it's I think in a rehearsal you're preparing for that moment, which is the gig. So it's just about going over and over again, like breaking down little things that mm. don't work or need improving or yeah, it's, it's very different. What would you say those little things are? Uh, parts sometimes uh, where someone comes in or comes out like if something's not really tight like all those little things okay and you play guitar and piano how did you learn to play those instruments um I was self-taught on guitar so when I was seven I wanted to play guitar my uncle's a guitarist he's an well he plays loads of instruments and he's a musician and I admired his so much and he used to spend a lot of time in in, in our in our house when I was around that age so I remember I actually remember him like in the evening just playing his guitar and I was like I want to do that and I loved music I was obsessed with the Beatles when I was like seven um so I asked for one I got one and I he started to teach me like a couple of chords but I, I had no patience so I didn't do it <laughs> I didn't learn it and I put it put it away and it yeah this day there and then when I was 12 no 11 11 or 12 I got obsessed with Avril Lavigne um and my parents took me to see her for my birthday um to manchester arena actually oh ah, yeah full circle the full circle um, moment yeah and i just saw her there and i was like because I, I was obsessed to the point where i couldn't sleep at night because i could hear the songs in my head no way it was really yeah i physically remember like i think i'm just a bad sleeper to be honest <laughs> so I, I tend to have insomnia every now and then but i just couldn't i, I closed my eyes in the night and i like, had the songs like running in my head i was like oh um so they took me to see her and i just saw her there and i was like, i want to do that i just went like i want to i want to be a musician so i picked up the guitar from the cupboard and i started to teach myself um and then my uncle whenever i'd see him he'd like give me learn this chord like but he lives quite far away from where we live so it was and it wasn't like zoom times where you just like so he gave me this book of chords that he made <laughs> so with that and like just internet i just taught myself oh, um, wow. 
And then I decided one day I wanted to be a singer. And I never sang in my life. So that was interesting. Really? Yeah, I just went to my mum and I was like, the guy in the kitchen, she was making dinner. I was like, mum, I want to be a singer. And she was like, great, sing to me. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like completely paralyzed. I was like, I'm going to rehearse a bit more. I'll be back. And I'd go and like practice a song and come in and I just couldn't physically sing to her. No way. Yeah, I don't know why I did that. So wait, when did you... Okay, that's so interesting. So you actually picked up the guitar and started playing that before you actually even wanted to sing then yeah yeah mental yeah. so then wait so when did you discover oh wait i can actually sing this actually works i don't even know i don't think I'd, <laughs> I, I i don't even, i don't know i think i just went i just want to i want to do that and i was like <laughs> i'm gonna i don't know actually <laughs> I don't think I, I don't think I thought I was any good. <laughs> Crazy! Oh my god! Because yeah. then you would have had to end up um, as one of your guitarists. Then you would have just been playing guitar yeah. instead of actually being like a full package musician and singer. Yeah. I, to be honest, I actually don't know why I decided I wanted to sing. I, I probably just liked it and wanted to. I don't know actually. Oh my god! Wait, where was there a moment that your mum was like, Nadia, you can actually sing? Uh probably i don't think they told me like but they did encourage me like mm -hmm. when i did eventually like sing she was like okay cool yeah just keep going kind of like thing and then they probably realized that i was all right <laughs> i do remember my dad i do remember my dad at one point kind of saying because i was like really into the music and i was like I, that's what I'll do like I'd, I'd like come home like do my homework and then just sit on my guitar wow um, and I remember like watching TV and still like playing like my chords yeah so I, I don't know I, I just loved it I just really really liked it and um, and I, re I remember my dad once kind of being like like we'll, su like, we'll support you like we'll support you and doing music if you want but like you have to be serious about it like if, you, if you're serious about it we'll support you kind of thing hmm. so I was like ooh pressure's on kind of thing but it just meant that they were okay so if you want to do piano lessons like we'll find yeah. a way of getting you piano lessons or i was gonna say when did piano come into play then um that was after so when i entered that con competition thing that my teacher told me to um i got to the final and I, I came second but the the judges were like oh get some like music lessons like you should learn piano as well so then i went to the school like the local music school and I started doing piano, but they taught classical. So I was like, I like sit down for like two minutes, try to practice like my classical piece, literally last two minutes. And then I'd go and try to to play on the piano what I was playing on guitar, like the chords and stuff. So I was in a way teaching myself chords because no one was teaching me the chords. And then I just went to my teacher and I went like, look, I love you, but you either give me something pop or I'm just going to have yeah. to quit because I can't. Like, it, it, I like it, but it's not. So we came to a compromise and she would teach me one classical piece and one pop piece. Okay. So that's how kind of I started. Um, Do you still remember the classical pieces to this day? I don't remember them by heart, but I, I teach as well. Oh, really? Yeah. What piano? And guitar and singing. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Oh, Nadia, you're the full package. Man. London is expensive. Man. <laughs> <laughs> That's exceptional. So I, I do classical still. So it was a, a great skill to learn because now it feeds me, basically. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And okay, that's brilliant. And Nadia, you've performed in Spain. You've performed on national TV in Spain as well. You've been featured on Spanish radio and it's not a coincidence. You're obviously Spanish. Tell me, when did you move to the UK from Spain? So... Uh, I'm half Spanish, half British, so I do have uh, both nationalities. My dad's British, um, and I was always kind of like coming and going. In like my parents travel a lot for work, and my grandparents live um, live in in Leeds, so I was kind of like always coming and going, and mm. it, I was very much like halfway. Um, not not in terms of like living. I lived in Spain, but like we used to watch like the BBC uh, like at home and stuff. Uh, but I moved to London when I was eighteen. Wow! And do, were you early on in your in your life writing songs more in Spanish, considering you lived there? No, more in English, which is weird. Okay, yeah. I think it's because most of the music I was listening to was in English. Makes sense. And what would you say are the differences between 
performing in Spain and performing in the UK? Um, I think the audiences are very different in a way, just culturally. Like it's two different countries. Like, and and we found that a lot in the in the Stereophonics talk as we went to so many countries. Mm. The audiences are very different, and their reactions are very different. I'd love to know an example of one country where you just did not expect their reaction at all. France was amazing. France. France. Well, I guess in a way you could sort of expect it. I don't know. France was so, like, they were amazing. Mm. We did two nights at the, the Olympia in Paris and they were so nice. The audience was just, like, there for it. Oh. Um, there's other countries that are colder, mm. but that's just the culture. Mm. So we played a couple of gigs where I thought, oh, maybe they didn't like it as much and then it was we sold so much merch or people would come after the gig and like come and say hi and like say they loved it but their actual reactions yeah were so much colder whereas in italy everyone was like cheering so much and my guitar my then guitarist was italian as well uh. so, so they were like there for it um so it's very different uh, and and in a way between the uk and spain is very different as well um also when i'm playing in spain i play a lot of songs in English mm. so it, it might be harder to connect with people because of the language mm -hmm. but then again it's it's my home so <laughs> I have that connection and I, and I speak to the audience in Spanish so it's very it's different but the, the core is the same okay yeah and I love your songwriting I love how vivid it is it's very easy to envision what you're trying to say I'd love to know what is your songwriting process and when do the best ideas come to you do they come to you like in a shower in the car like, <laughs> <Yes. what? laughs> I'd love the to worst know points. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, th thank you um I think well I think I've evolved a lot as a lyricist um once I think as you get older, you sort of understand more things and you live more things. That's one thing. But also the more you write songs and you use words, you sort of learn how to say things differently or mm. say things in the way you want to say them rather than the way they just come out. Um, also what you're listening to. Like I remember I, like, I got into Fontaine's DC like when they came out and just suddenly like opening up that sort of more poetic kind of like beat kind of stuff and you start to dig into that kind of like literature and so it's it's about growing and like learning in those areas mm. um yes uh, i've had loads of lyric ideas in the car and in the shower that i've forgotten because i can write them down <laughs> no but, I, but someone told me it's because like apparently don't quote yeah. me on this because i don't actually know the science but when you're doing something so mechanical like having a shower or like driving you open up a, like a part of your brain on the creative side because you're doing something that doesn't require so much brain power that opens up so more ideas come in wow something like that don't quote me on it but someone told me something like that which makes sense no that doesn't because what like you're almost just so relaxed that ideas just flow more easily i think it's because you're an autopilot mm. so I, for example i think when i'm driving is because i'm really alert because if suddenly something happened i'd know i'd break mm. but I am doing something that is very mechanical and I can't do anything else. I think that's what it, mm. what it is for me. Like, I can't hold my phone. I can't do something else while I'm doing that thing. Mm. So if I'm doing a phone call or, like, I'm doing something and, and I can still look at my phone or I can, f f like, fiddle or fidget or do... Then you're doing something else. But when you're driving, I can't do anything else. Yeah. So it's either I, I listen to the radio... Or I think, <laughs> yeah. or I think while I'm listening to the radio, which has also happened a lot of times. And you come up with lyrics. <laughs> yeah, because it, 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 you, you just start thinking. And I read something the other day, it's like, we need to be more bored. Mm. We need to be more bored. I completely agree. I completely agree. I feel like we're so overstimulated all the time. Totally. And it's so easy to feed into different distractions. Oh my gosh, I love that you've said that. Thank you so much for sharing that. How are you able to cut off distractions, Nadia? It's hard. Mm. I mean, I am. I'm not gonna. Not I'm not a guru. I'm not gonna say I do it. But like for example, just if I go for a walk, for a moment, taking my headphones off mm. and actually just just doing the thing, which is just walking and sitting with my thoughts. And before I had like Bluetooth headphones or like noise cancelling headphones, I. I used to do that all the time. Mm -hmm. I used to like sit in the tube and like come up with lyric ideas because I was just sat there. I'm like, mm, whatever. <laughs> or like before there was like Wi-Fi stations or stuff, like I'd read a book or I'd like yeah. 
write like li- little lyrics and stuff like that. And I think we are so overstimulated that we are cutting that off mm. a lot. And there's so much to do as well. There's always stuff to do. Yeah, all the time. Um, so I think like like I I um. So I read I, I read that recently about being bored, but also um, there's this artist called Jenny Beth. Mm-hmm. Um, she had a band called, I don't know if the band's still active or not, uh, called Savages. And on Instagram, she every now and then she'll share like things I noticed. And it's really nice because it's just like a list of like little things that she noticed. Wow. And one of the things was like, if I have to wait, f- like, go, like f- going forward or whatever, if I have to wait in a queue, I'm not going to look at my phone. Or I'm not going to listen to anything like little waits, just wait. Like, mm. like if you like, for example, if we're at the supermarket, if there's like two people in front of me, I'll pull out my phone. Mm. You just don't even sit there and like. It's so subconscious, isn't it? Yeah, you might not. You might have the biggest idea of your life. You might meet your best friend. You might meet. You don't know what's going to happen. You might avoid like, I don't know, an accident or something just by being present mm. in the moment. And we don't do it. So that's another thing that kind of caught my eye recently. And I'm like, that's good. Being less on social media, actually. Underestimated. <laughs> underestimated. That was honestly beautifully worded, Nadia. And I couldn't agree more. Thank you for sharing that. I love that so much. Has there been anything else that you've learned? And I'll take it back musically. Within your musical career that you've learned now about yourself, which you would want to tell your younger self? Ooh. For example, don't go on your phone when you're in the queue and there's two people in front of you. <laughs> I think oops. It sounds so cliche, but stop pressuring yourself and enjoy the journey. And also allow yourself to be creative. Just allow yourself to be creative. For real. And allow yourself to be creative. Could you break that down more for someone that doesn't know how to approach that yet? Yeah, so I, so for the most part of my career, I had no team, um, self-managed, like, um, I did work with a manager for a little bit, didn't work out, that's fine, but I was putting so much pressure on myself, and I still do it, but less, in a different way now, Mm. but I put so much pressure, so much pressure on myself, and I always felt like I was doing not enough, so I was working myself to the ground, being really like talking really, really negatively to myself oh, no. and also because the thing I love the most is making the music mm. I would like no I need to send that email instead of like sit down on my piano for half an hour mm. and just do mm. nothing just just play for fun mm. so I wouldn't allow myself to do the thing I love the most because I thought that I had to be working or I had this pressure of doing stuff so I'd just tell my young self it's like it's, it's, don't don't be silly (laughs) (laughs) enjoy the journey that's that's where it comes from wow beautifully said Nadia thank you Nadia we've got this thing that we do on quite the ordinary podcast with Moonlight and West where I ask you one quote from your whole discovery that you love the most and I'm going to give you a second to think producer Dara is very kindly going to hand me the binder and you can write it down in our legendary binder thank you oh my days We've already got two in here. You're going to be our third. And we have to read it out. Yeah, you're going to okay. read it out to us, then you're going to write it down. And if oh you'd like, God. I can read you some quotes from the other guests we've had. Yeah. All right, so this is from Nesta Stefan. She said, educate yourself, discipline yourself, love yourself like anybody loves you. Teach yourself how to make a dream come true. Reminder, it's not only about you. That's That's so nice. That's so nice, isn't it? I agree. And then we've got our previous one from I Am The Artist. And she says, don't forget, they sell out for a salary. Watch and pretend. And they covered in the eulogy. So. Oh, that's a good. (laughs) Fresh is on. (laughs) (laughs) There's no pressure whatsoever. Whatever quote comes to mind. It can even be from your new EP as well. I'm going to give you the binder. So you can actually feel the energy of all the other people that have written quotes from their own songs. <laughs> and in your own time, when you've got a quote from the whole discovery, please write it down in our famous Quite the Ordinary podcast, Binder. I'm going to use a quote from my song, Quiet. Okay. Um, it's a song I wrote. Uh, well, this is, can apply to anyone, right? The quote is going to apply to anyone 
who feels like they don't have a voice. But I wrote this song because sometimes as a woman, I feel like, like uh, as women, we don't have a voice or our thoughts or ideas can or are undermined. Um, so the final chorus in the song is quiet. Don't keep it quiet. Uh, just break your silence and speak your mind. Mm. So I think that's just <laughs> very that's good. <laughs> very good. I love it. So I just write it down. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Write it down. And then after we'll put the day and your name underneath. I feel like a school girl writing the date. <laughs> yeah. Can that. I have a look? Yes. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> that looks beautiful. Okay, do you know what, Nadia, read it out for us. Yes. So it's a uh, quiet, don't keep it quiet, just break your silence and speak your mind. Beautiful. <laughs> do exactly that. A quote from Quiet, from your EP, Never Ending Trial. Beautiful. Nadia, thank you so much for coming on to Quite the Ordinary podcast That's with Moonlight me. West. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for your beautiful quote. I'm sure many people will be implementing it into their lives. I surely will. It's a fantastic one. And sending you high vibrations and lots of success, Nadia. Thank you for coming Thank on. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>